But you didn't watch too much of the Bellas documentary, the biography. How much of Steve Austin and The Rock WWE Rivals did you watch? Every single solitary second of it. Because that was, in hindsight, I know Bobo Brazil and The Sheik lasted longer. I know the Midnight and the Rock and Roll were very hot for the territories, but we didn't have the worldwide television and reach and the hot period. The I'm trying to think of any uh, any other famous program. Hogan and Andre wasn't a long-running program, but it was the landmark match that, at the time, WrestleMania three did what a nine buy rate, which was like cartoon-like. It was like moon landing ratings for pay-per-view at the time. That meant that nine percent of the people in the United States of America that had access to pay-per-view television bought WrestleMania three. And of course, if you did that today, it would gross somewhere around seven hundred fifty million fucking dollars or whatever. But that I can't think of a bigger money program, both in terms of money and in people, probably when you add it up, that bought tickets. Even if you might have to go back to Lewis and Londos or something like that to find that many people buying tickets in that period of time to see a program between two wrestlers as Steve Austin and the rock. So if you go for rivals, this was the one. And I know, you know, Taker and Kane was good and all the other ones they've got, except for Stephanie and Brie Bella. I'm sure, you know, those, those are all great rivalries, but this was the money. This was, and the first time in history, there was always in wrestling. There was always the man, the big attraction the number one box office star. And they came along every so often from Lewis to Londos to Longson to fucking all the way up to Hogan. But there'd always only been one at a time. And all of a sudden, Austin got there a little bit first, as the program noted. But the number one guy in the business within six months has the next number one guy coming up and they both in actuality, I think it's one and two, one a and one B or one a and one B instead of one and two, they were both the number one guy because they were both so fucking over. And then rock seamlessly takes over, you know, from Austin for the short period of time till rock goes and makes movies. But this was the rivalry in wrestling and it violates Everything that Vince McMahon has tried to do in the 25 years since with his company. Because these guys were polar opposites. You got a beer drinking, hellraiser, working man against a slick movie star personality, braggadocious, loudmouth, but they're both great wrestlers. And and they were real. The people bought them. They bought Austin specifically because he was so real and they believed in him. And that's why it hurt the business irreversibly when he switched heel and hugged Vince, as we'll get to at the end of the deal, because they lost their faith then. And you can make wrestling fans mad all you want, but when they lose their faith, you've lost them. The point is, is that these guys were real and the people believed in them and they took the ride with them and they got lost in it. And, from the video that they show and from the interviews that they show and from the the talking heads, including Austin and Rock, you could tell they looked serious. They, you, they made you believe in what they were doing and the action was so exciting and the people were so into it. That's what drove the Attitude Era. Shit Stain can talk all he wants about writing for everybody up and down the top of the card, which was the the problem because you wasted a lot and a lot got lost it didn't need to be done that took attention away from the people drawing the money but you couldn't you couldn't fuck up stars like this by just letting them go out and do their thing and be themselves and they mentioned that you know the rock it fits his gimmick that is he is his gimmick but it fit his gimmick that he came along and took like a year to get over when Austin had been 
seven years before that, he's in Memphis eating fucking raw baked potatoes, right? I guess that's a contradiction in terms. A raw baked potato. Raw potatoes. Couldn't afford to heat them up. And it took him seven years to get there. Rock got over in one. But, and then, whereas Austin had to fight and scratch and overcome the ringmaster gimmick, the only thing that Rocky had to overcome was the the push that they started him out with and the fact that Rocky and Pat Patterson getting together when he started, he was Pat's personal project because Vince wanted it that way because he was the future. Put your best man on the job. And they were thinking of classic babyface and what The Rock, Dwayne had seen Rocky Johnson do in San Francisco along with Pat and or Memphis or wherever to be a baby face. And, but he was too young and too fresh faced and too smiling. And at the same time, he got pushed down everybody's throat before the fans had decided he was ready. And that's why they turned on him. And that was the best thing to happen to him. A lot because if Vince had continued pushing him as that smiling baby face that doesn't get beat, they would have really backlashed against him. But when he got that brief injury and they brought him back as a heel with the nation, we knew that Ron Simmons was the veteran and the leader of the nation of domination, but also knew that Rocky was the future and he was the project in the group. And as it went further, the group became literally the vehicle to get rock over. And that's how it it changed because you could see the people reacting to him more and more. And, and, but I love the footage because just the chaos and the action and the violence that you could see that the people were, I wish I got royalties on this series, by the way, because there I was again at, at, I can't even, I didn't even remember Austin doing the promo where he walked across the desk and there I am, me and JR sitting there at his feet. I'd forgotten how long we called him Rocky Maivia, even after he started calling himself The Rock. But anyway, two guys that looked like stars really mad at each other. And then you could just do the angles where one was one up and the other. And I love the, uh, who was it? It was Rocky said, oh, it tossed the belt off the bridge in 1998. They did that deal with the Intercontinental title belt. Like that was so revolutionary, it never been seen before, except when Ronnie Garvin did the same thing with the Southeastern belt in 1978 in Knoxville. Well, it never been seen on national TV. I understand I why know. Freddie Prince Jr. had never seen it before. It makes sense. Oh, that's right. It was Freddie Prince that said it had never been done. That's, and that's not, I like Freddie Prince. He's got a nice voice and he seems like a camera friendly personality, but that panel is just a waste of time, just a waste of of minutes on television that you could be using for your subject. But by the way, I'll have you know that Garvin's he promoted the thing and they stopped traffic on the gay street bridge in Knoxville. He got on TV and said two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to be down. I'm going to throw this belt off the edge of the bridge. The cops had to come and, and fucking close the goddamn bridge down. They got the people off of it. Anyway, um, from that point, they're the two absolute biggest names in the business. Then The Rock becomes the corporate champion, which was perfect for Austin's don't trust anybody, take this job and shove it. We'd forgotten how great Vince was in the beer truck fucking deal where he's swimming in the ring. And they had a great match at Mania 1999. And I, I again, were reminded the signs were everywhere. And they weren't smart fan wrestling signs they were clever smart ass wrestling fan signs it wasn't like Meltzer fears whatever or even anything about me although that is a safe bet every time if you want to make a sign about me but it was it was just fan signs Gabby can you tell what I'm the difference in what I'm saying it was clever shit every once in a while but it wasn't talking about star ratings or newsletters Everybody had a fucking sign. It was a goddamn happening. It was about who was over. Yeah. And, you know, the rock ascends while Austin is out with the bad neck, and then they come to 
WrestleMania 2001, which I was there for. Obviously, I was on the card, but I was in the locker room, watched the match on the monitor. And besides the the finish, which killed the business forevermore, um, because Steve admitted that he wanted to freshen up and he wanted to turn heel. They didn't mention that it killed the business. Paul Heyman said it was a difficult image for people to absorb, which, God, he's so smooth. But that match, I sent out a memo along with a VHS tape, which was the thing then, to all the Ohio Valley wrestling talent. I said, here's WrestleMania, but watch the main event. These two guys just drew $50 million in one night, and neither one of them came off the top rope one time. This is what you need to learn. But then, you know, Austin's injuries and Rock's already got movie parts. And by WrestleMania 2003, that's going to be the end of it. And that's Austin's last match. And boy, again, with a lot of this footage, not only the match, but the angles, Jim Ross's calls were next level at that point in time. Also, you could hear the fucking energy and the excitement and the chaos in his voice of what was being reflected on your screen. And it, it just, again, it shows, and all of these programs show the drastic discrepancy in what we were seeing and what we are seeing now. And if you, if you had tape of that quality, Back from the 70s, you would see the same thing if you showed a great match from the 70s. Today, in high, I know a lot of people get bored because it's one camera in the stands with no lighting, and they, uh, but if you had that type of high definition where you could be brought into it, the chaos was there, the violence was there, the excitement was there, the guy's aggression was there. It, it's just been in the last 10, 15 years, whatever it is, that we've completely lost that. And nobody can buy 90% of this anymore. Whether you know it's a work or not, you still want to see people who look like they halfway mean the acting that they're doing. And guys are getting hurt more and more. A lot of danger, a lot of risk, very little fucking effort in the right places, and a lack of a result at the end. So, yeah, but my, my takeaway from this was Vince made so much money with this kind of wrestling, but you couldn't pry him away from the silliness and the fart jokes and the bodily function jokes and the midget in the bathroom and whatever that he really wanted to do. And when he was pushed and had competition, he would allow shit like this to go on. But then since then, he's gone back to having a pie fight with Lou Albano on Tuesday Night Titans in 1985. The people want to believe. He doesn't want to let them. Or he didn't. Maybe now they might again, a little, somewhat. 